morning, everybody. Okay. Let's start with visualizing the uh, refuge field and the space in front of us. Ourselves surrounded by all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And get in touch with the need you feel inside your own heart for spiritual guidance. And then recall some of the qualities of the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. and turn to them for refuge. So take a moment and think about what is meaningful in your life. Are sense pleasures meaningful? What is it that actually gives meaning and purpose to your life? Is it the possibility of attaining nirvana that gives meaning? What about the possibility of attaining full awakening? What is the difference of in feeling inside of you when you think I want to attain nirvana and be free of samsara and I want to attain full awakening and become a Buddha? What, what's the difference in feeling? What, uh, what gives your life meaning? And aren't we dependent on other living beings to give our life meaning? And how do other living beings give our life meaning? Is it only so that we can use them for our own pleasure? 
or is it because they are the objects of our compassion and our bodhicitta? And bodhicitta really gives our life meaning and purpose. And to generate Mudichidu, we need to hear teachings and study those teachings, put them into practice. And so that's why we're here this morning. So last week I uh, was talking about one letter I received from somebody who wanted some help. And another letter turned up this morning, (laughs) perfectly fitting in with this practice, with this chapter, okay, of, uh, I'm not, I think he's young, not not a young man, who was studying to be a a journalist, Asking, you know, what's what's the meaning of my life? What's the purpose of my life? Is it just to stay alive? Is that the purpose of my life, just to stay alive? But if it ends in death at the end, why why go through, you know, what's the use of that? Uh, Is it just to have pleasure and run around and have as much pleasure as I can as long as I'm alive? Um, but then that too, yeah, okay, you have a lot of pleasure, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. What else is new? That doesn't give any kind of lasting meaning. And uh, then he's, he spoke about nirvana and said, uh, I'm not quite sure uh, what his understanding of nirvana is, but, uh, you know, it's the, the idea that you feel bliss. You know, and you live in a uh, circumstance of bliss all the time. And he said, yeah, that's nice, but that doesn't feel particularly meaningful either. Yeah, I agree with him. (laughs) You know, I can see, yes, stopping the suffering of, of samsara would be good. Yeah. Um, but just the idea of nirvana alone doesn't excite me. Yeah. When I think about bodhicitta, that excites me. Okay. Because, and then you say, well, then what's the difference? Uh, bodhicitta, bodhicitta, you help other people, but you know, I help other people this life too, but that doesn't really fulfill it. Yeah. Okay. And that happens, I think, because we help others this lifetime, but we don't see, we see some benefit that happens now in the short term, but we don't see any long-term benefit. You know, you give somebody food, which they appreciate a lot, and it solves their hunger for a few hours, and then they're hungry again, and they need more, okay? And here's where, uh, you know, the idea of bodhicitta is, for me, it really grabs me in the sense that it's not, uh, it it includes giving people food and clothing and shelter and medicine and education and support and all of that. But it also goes far beyond that because when you think of 
the cycle of existence, samsara, and going round and around and around, then, you know, you help people some by helping them in this life. But if you can help them get out of the cycle of samsara, then, you know, uh, it's really meaningful because then they are immune to all uh, states of dukkha, whether it's uh, the dukkha of pain, the dukkha of change, the, um, the, you know, the dukkha, the pervading dukkha of conditioning. Uh, y- you're able to help them free themselves from all of that. And that becomes, to me, really meaningful. Okay, so, uh, yes, uh, then this person said, well, yeah, you know, I can think of Bodhicitta and doing that, but then, you know, I have to do so much to become a Buddha, and, you know, sometimes it just seems so hard and so impossible, and you know, I, I, you know, I just need, I work really hard for a time and then I get exhausted and I don't want to do anything, uh, you know, and then, okay, I pull myself together and then I start working hard for sentient beings and get exhausted and then, you know, again, and, and then, when I feel exhausted, then I feel guilty because I should be doing more. You know, I mean, sentient beings need help and I'm exhausted and I just want to rest and I feel guilty because I should do something, you know. And like, why am I so lazy and why can't I get over this? And, you know, does it really have any meaning at all? Do any of you get tangled up in that way of thinking? Yeah? It's amazing, isn't it, what our mind can come up with to make us miserable. And when we're in the middle of it, it all seems to make perfect sense, doesn't it? Yeah? Oh, I'm so lazy. What's the remedy to laziness? Feel guilty. (laughs) Yeah, and if you feel guilty enough, you'll do something. Uh, That doesn't actually work. We've tried that before, haven't we? Yeah, does guilt get you going? Yeah, sometimes if you really shove yourself uh, and make yourself do something, the guilt will work. Yeah, but then after you do something, it's like, oh, forget it. I just want to go rest again. Yeah. So this is where we're on the chapter about joyous effort, you know, coincidentally, which is kind of the remedy to the whole thing. Yeah, because, but in trying to cultivate joyous effort, we start to see all the little ditches our mind digs for itself and then falls into, okay? One of them being guilt, yeah, as if guilt is going to help me overcome my laziness, yeah. Uh, The other is just saying, well, it doesn't mean anything anyway, so I try. And that one, when you're in the middle of it, it makes so much sense, doesn't it? Yeah, well, you die in the end, so why exert so much effort? And you help somebody a little bit, but then they just do the same old thing again. (sighs) Yeah, and it seems when you're in the middle of that, that that everything's useless. Okay. But then remember sometime when... You know, in the past, where you lacked confidence, or where you lacked an opportunity, or when the opportunity was there, but you didn't know how to engage with that opportunity. Yeah. 
and somebody came along and just encouraged you or taught you the one simple thing that you need to do that got you that opportunity so you could take advantage of it. Yeah, were there times in your life where somebody came along and kind of said, hey, yeah, your life is worthwhile, you are worthwhile, you are valuable. Here, try this little thing. And you tried it, and wow, something new happened. Okay, now, that was some little thing, but it was also something quite big, wasn't it? And imagine if you had that sensitivity to other people where you could just do sometimes little things that really removed what was seemingly a big obstacle but wasn't, you know, for another person. And then they went ahead with that. My experience being a teacher before I ordained was all it takes is one adult who is really interested in a child who's floundering. You know, just one adult who pays attention to that child. That's all that's needed. Yeah. Somebody who really can connect with one kid who's acting out or not doing very well in school or troubled. Yeah. So what about if, you know, we w- could develop ourselves to that point where there was a sensitivity and awareness inside of our, of us about, you know, things that we could do for a child or an adult. Yeah, that would really help them. And then you see one thing, you know, that person takes that opportunity, which leads to another one, which leads to another one, which leads to another one. In the same way that if somebody doesn't have opportunities, one bad choice leads to the next bad choice, leads to the next bad choice. Okay? And, you know, aiming to become a Buddha, so we have that full sensitivity, yes. You know, so we have the wisdom, we have the compassion, we have the skillful means, we have the power, you know, not just to do little things, but to actually lead somebody on the path to awakening, You know, that's really something big. And becoming a Buddha is something big. But we can also help people right now. Yeah. In whatever big or small way we can. And that gives meaning and purpose to our life. Yeah. His Holiness Dalai Lama always says that we are um, social creatures as human beings. We're social creatures. We live together with others of our species. Yeah. We're not like spiders who go into each, everybody, every spider is in their own corner. Okay. Yeah. We, we engage with each other. And so having the ability to engage in a way where we can see that, uh, it alleviates suffering and brings joy in other people, that is something meaningful. So we start with the small things we can do now, and then we work up to, you know, as we practice the path, we're able to do more and more and more. And uh, and so that, that feeling of meaning becomes greater and greater. Okay? So it's a thing of noticing our potential and noticing uh, the opportunities we have rather than noticing, like, well, 
nothing ever changes in the long term. Yeah. So it's kind of like the glass half empty and the glass half full way of thinking, depending on what you train your mind to look at. Yeah. And can you, can you see uh, potential in other living beings? Often, you know, the, the people who are more advanced spiritually see potential in us that we can't see in ourselves. And they kind of nudge us along or <laughs> whack us along, depending upon what we need sometimes. But they actually see the potential that we, who think we know ourselves so well, can't even see in ourselves, that we're blind to. Yeah. And it can help to have another person point that out, point that potential out, and give us a nudge. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's get back to what interferes with having that joyous effort. Yeah, the first one was laziness, just wanting to laze around. We talked a long time about that one, okay, and how thinking that our life is slipping away all the time, and uh, we actually have a very precious life, not just being any old human being, but having a precious human life where we have access to the Dharma, interest in the Dharma, good circumstances to practice, everything that's needed. Yeah. And that and remembering that will get us off the couch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For all the couch potatoes. Um, it gets us off the couch and, and doing something, you know. And then the second one is um, being the busiest of the busy, doing meaningless activities. So we spent, uh, I think, three weeks on that, going through all the different kinds of ways in which we um, keep ourselves busy doing things that are useless. And it's not just keeping ourselves busy physically doing useless things. It's how we use our mind. Yeah. So spinning around with, you know, uh, sentient beings are hopeless and I'm also hopeless. And in the end we all die. So it doesn't mean anything. And, uh, you know, I'd rather just get drunk. Uh, and, or, you know, smoke some weed or, you know, whatever it is, you know, how, how that way, that also distracts us, you know. And I thought it was very interesting, you know, one of the people who did retreat with us this winter saw that all her social engagement work, yeah, was also a form of distraction from working with her mind. And developing her good qualities because she was so busy, yeah, pointing out things to other people. So, you know, we always need to check our mind and what our motivation is. Then, okay, so that was verse 15. I'll read it again to rub it in a little bit more. <laughs> Having rejected the supreme joy of the sacred dharma, which is a boundless source of delight, why am I distracted by the causes for pain? Why do I enjoy frivolous amusements and the like? Okay. So why is dharma the cause of delight? It's not just because we're looking for the bliss of nirvana. It's not just our own bliss. It's a cause of delight, yeah, because we can free not only ourselves, but really help other li living beings be free from samsara as well. Okay, and so seeing that, why am I distracted for the, uh, by the causes for pain, doing all the stupidagios I do uh, to distract myself? 
Uh, and, you know, why do I enjoy frivolous amusements and the like? And, we, you know, we've all done that. I mean, so much of our life has been about frivolous amusements that we thought were actually wonderful and highly meaningful. And, you know, wasn't that a great time we had? And look at this wonderful person I met who thinks I'm wonderful. And look at the money I got and how I could get more things with it. And look at, you know, now finally my parents approve of me. I've got a corner office. And, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, which in the end really doesn't solve the problem, does it? Yeah. And it just, yeah, we get stuck in a lot of uh, negative actions in that way. Okay. So, that, so, you know, how do we get over that? We look and see what is really meaningful in our life. Yeah. And I have to say, when looking for the meaning in life, yeah, we often, we start with, there's a creator, and the creator created me for a purpose. So I've got to figure out what the purpose the creator God had for me, and that is what gives me purpose and meaning in my life. Okay? So... If you are a follower of a, of a theistic religion, that argument works for you, okay? For Buddhists, it doesn't work because we don't believe that there's a creator, and we don't believe that anybody created, that somebody somewhere created lesson plans for us so that we can learn all these lessons and that there's an ultimate uh, um kind of state that where, you know, you've pleased God enough to earn your way into heaven. And, uh, and so, you know, God set the bar and you, you met, you met the bar, you passed. Okay. So Buddhists don't look at life that way. Yeah. There, it's not that somebody else, some external creator gives life to our life, uh, meaning to our life. Yeah. It's us by seeing what we can do with our precious human life. And that we give meaning to our own lives, you know, by relating to other living beings and caring for them in the same way that our lives are benefited and feel more meaningful when other people reach out and help us. Okay, is this making some sense? This is, I think, quite important because otherwise we can run ourselves into the hole of everything's useless anyway, which is not true. Yeah, that's another one of the lies we tell ourselves. Okay, so now verse 16. What's the thing? Okay, we've got off the couch yeah, we've stopped running around to bars and movies and, you know, uh, social engagement projects and everything else we do. Now, what does our self-centered mind come up with to tell us that we can't do anything and our life is meaningful, meaningless? What does it come up with? I can't do it. It's just too hard. The goal of becoming a Buddha is too high. It's too high. Who in their right mind can become a Buddha? Okay, Shakyamuni did it, but he's the only one. I can't do that. Goal's too high. And the path is too hard. You read about all these things that the bodhisattvas do, Oh, my God, I can't do that. You know, what am I supposed to do? Go look for the nearest mountain lion and, you know, or cougar, mountain lion, same thing. You know, look for the nearest one and offer my body, and that's the way I practice the path. 
Yeah, I don't really feel like offering my body to some cougar at this point. Yeah, it'll hurt too much. Huh? And then doing some stuff around the abbey, I just, you know, that doesn't do much either. How to, how does you know serving the sangha and serving the lay followers and teaching everybody and doing stuff? It doesn't you know how's that gonna wind up in anything good? Yeah, I can crack a joke in the middle of teachings and people laugh. Yeah, big deal. But you know you teach them and then they they're like puppies. You know, you give them a bath and they go out and roll in mud again. Yeah. So how does how am I going to benefit all these beings? Anyway, you know, I'm just incapable. I can't become a Buddha. It's just too difficult. I am poor quality. And I know they talk about, yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody has Buddha nature. But I don't. You know, if you look at a Sangha's text, there's that. Itchitankas, or however you say it, one kind of sentient being who doesn't have the Buddha nature. That's me. Yeah. Okay, okay. They say that they only temporarily don't have the Buddha nature. Still, it's me. Temporarily is forever. I can't do it. Yeah, they handed out Buddha nature and I didn't get any. <sighs> yeah, Pat. goal's too high, path is too hard. Anyway, I'm too stupid, too incapable, impossible. So those three things we tell ourselves. Yeah, the goal can't do, path can't do. Something's wrong with me. Well, of course something is wrong with me. I feel guilty all the time. Yeah, I should be helping sentient beings. I feel guilty because I can't. So, see, yeah, you even tell me how to have joy in my life and I can't free myself from the guilt. So, see, I don't have Buddha nature. I can't do anything. We are so creative in thinking up obstacles for ourselves. Incredibly creative. And all of it is a bunch of big, fat lies that we believe. So see, I told you how stupid I was, how incapable I was, because I believe all these lies that tell me I'm I'm incapable. Yeah? Yeah? Do you think that way is maybe a little bit stupid? Yeah, see, I'm stupid, I'm incapable. (laughs) Yeah, we just, you know, tangle ourselves up in knots for no purpose with a bunch of false statements that don't hold water at all. Okay. So, verse 16, without indulging in despondency, I should gather the supports for enthusiasm and earnestly take control of myself. Then, by seeing the equality between self and others, I should practice exchanging self for others. Oh, yeah, I know, I should practice exchanging self for others. Ugh. That's just too hard to do. Without indulging in despondency, but I've been despondent my whole life. Give me a break, okay? You know, we got to change that way of thinking. It's just getting us tangled up into a big fat mess, okay? So how do you break out of it? Well, you start meditating more on precious human life. You start meditating on the qualities of the Buddha Dharma Sangha and think, 
that I can attain those in the future. It doesn't mean I have to do it tomorrow. It's a long path, but look what I can become if I try. Okay. And then it says, and earnestly take control of myself. It's not like, okay, come on, children, you know, go sit down on that cushion. Um, No. (laughs) It's, you know, why uh, do uh, so many of the Lamrim topics start with the benefits of this? Okay. Yeah. This text, what was the first chapter about? The benefits of bodhicitta. Okay. Then we have the benefits of relating to a spiritual mentor. The benefits of relying, of meditating on a precious human life. The benefits of uh, remembering impermanence. The benefits of, you know, bodhicitta. Everything. They start out talking about the benefits. Okay, so you start off thinking of the benefits and you op- you let your mind open a little bit to let that in. And then you think, oh, huh, that sounds good. I would like to be able to do that. Okay, and then to save yourself from all that self-deprecation and despondency, verse 17 says, I should never indulge in despondency by entertaining such thoughts as, how shall I ever awaken? That, yeah, goals too high, path too hard, I'm unqualified. How, how can I ever awaken? So we shouldn't indulge in despondency by intent entertaining that thought because you know when we have thought about things well we realize that such a thought is one of those big lies that we tell ourselves okay how do we know that the last two lines of verse 17 say for the tathagatas who speak what is true have uttered this truth Verse 18, and this is what the Buddha said, if they develop the strength of their exertion, even those who are flies, mosquitoes, bees, and insects will win the unsurpassable awakening, which is so hard to find. Okay, yeah. Then the last trick that the mind plays. Oh, okay. So I'm as intelligent as a fly, mosquito, bee, and insect. That's what I'm being compared to here. (sighs) Say, he told you I can't do it. Well, no, the Buddha said flies, mosquitoes, bees, and insects can do it. They can't do it with their present bodies. But there's more than this lifetime. And they can have precious human lives. They can be reborn in the pure land. And when you have that kind of opportunity, you know, a really good birth in that way, then, uh, you know, the, you know, even, even all the ticks. Yeah. The ticks, just tick season. Yeah. Uh, next comes mosquito season. Then comes a uh, wasp and bee and, um, but yellow jackets and hornets season. Yeah. Yeah. And all of them can become Buddhas too. Okay. Not in that lifetime, but they can take good rebirths in the next lifetime and be able to practice the path. And here's one way where we can help them practice the path when they get a, get a good rebirth. Yeah, that's why we walk the kitties around the uh, Buddha statue in the garden. Yeah, that's why we used to have teachings in Ananda. Yeah, those kitties heard a lot of teachings. 
Yeah, that's why often we say our prayers and mantras out loud, so the bugs, uh, you know, in the environment hear the prayers and mantras. Okay, this uh, all puts very good imprint in their mind, and then when they have a uh, you know like a precious human life, then that imprint can ripen into attraction to the Dharma. Okay, so those are small things we can do that become really, really meaningful for those beings because when they're born just, you know, as insects, it's difficult to create merit, yeah? So we can do small things like that that actually can have a significant result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard the story about um, there was one, uh, one man who wanted to, uh, ordain. I'm not going to tell the whole story with his brother and everything, but anything. Anyway, uh, he, he had a problem learning things. So the Buddha gave him the task of sweeping the, uh, the courtyard in the monastery. And when, when he was sweeping, he had to say, uh, 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 eliminate dirt, eliminate stain, eliminate dirt, eliminate stain every time he did this. Yeah. And he really wanted to ordain, but, uh, Shariputra, um, and Mogliana couldn't see that he had enough merit to be able to ordain. Okay. Uh, which, and they had, especially Mogliana, had psychic powers who could see, you know, this guy's previous karma. But his psychic powers were not as good as the Buddha's. So when the Buddha came to the monastery, this old man was crying. And the Buddha said, what's up? And he said, they won't let me ordain, and I want to ordain. And... Um, and the Buddha, with his powers, saw that one time, many eons ago, yeah, there was a stupa at, that had water, a moat around it, and some cow had pooped, uh, and the poop was floating in the water, you know, and it hardened to become dung, I guess. And there was a fly on top of the dung, and as the well, the the dung floated around the stupa, you know. Here was this fly having contact with a holy object, you know, that he had never had contact with for how many eons. And he goes around the stupa sometimes, and just that contact with the holy object, you know, that was the thing that uh, up the... The, uh, the karma thermometer. So he had enough to ordain and the Buddha ordained him. And then he realized that his saying, eliminate dirt, eliminate stain was talking about eliminating the afflictive obscurations, eliminating the, uh, cognitive obscurations. And he became a Buddha or an arhat or something, you know. So just, you know, floating around, that wasn't the only karma, but that was a, a chief thing that, you know, gave him enough merit to, to ordain. Because just to ordain, you need an incredible amount of merit. Okay, so, um, so we can help other beings in that way. Yeah. And we can, uh, you know, we have so much contact with holy objects all the time. And there's so many small ways that we can uh, create great amounts of merit, especially by generating bodhicitta before we do things, you know, like set up the, when we set up the altar in the morning, yeah, or take down the altar in the evening, or, you know, serve the sangha by doing dishes or working outdoors or something like that, okay? So here, here is Shanti Deva. Now, if, by this point in the text, I hope everybody here has some faith that in Shanti Deva, that uh, 
having studied what he's taught us so far, uh, this guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah, you have that kind of trust in him. Yeah, do you have some trust in what the Buddha said? Because how did Shanti Deva get his knowledge through through the Buddha? Okay, so if the Buddha, so if Shanti Deva says, you know. You should never indulge in despondency by entertaining such thoughts as how shall I ever awakening awaken? Uh, then, you know, if you trust him, shouldn't you kind of listen to what he's saying and say, well, no, I shouldn't entertain those thoughts. Yeah. And then if the Buddha said, and you have faith in the Buddha, you know, if they develop the strength of their exertion, even those who are flies, mosquitoes, bees, and insects, even hornets. Yeah, hornets are kind of, they're really bad, you know, especially the murder hornets. Yeah. All of those beings can become Buddhas, you know. Putin can become a Buddha. Yeah, he has a lot of karma to purify, but he also has that potential. And that potential never leaves us. Okay. And you'll see why as we continue in samsara, nirvana, and Buddha nature. <laughs> okay, so... If we believe what the Buddha says, then we should take these quotations seriously and think about them. Yeah. Not just dismiss them of, oh, well, the Buddha just said that, or, oh, so I'm like a fly. You know, that's not how the Buddha meant us to take this. Okay, so 19. It will be so if I do not forsake the Bodhisattva's way of life. Yeah, so I can have confidence in full awakening, which really brings about the utmost meaning in my life, if I don't forsake the Bodhisattva's way of life. Yeah, so why should someone like myself, who has been born in the human species, not attain awakening, since I am able to recognize what is beneficial and what is of harm. Yeah? So that's the first thing on the path, being able to recognize what is beneficial, what do I practice, and what is harmful, what do I abandon. And you'll see that again and again in the teachings. What to practice, what to abandon. Yeah, what is beneficial, what is harmful. So, we have the intelligence to discriminate that. Yeah. Now, the question is, are we going to use that intelligence? Yeah. Now, the intelligence, it doesn't mean we have to be straight A students in school. It's not that kind of intelligence. There are people who are brilliant rocket scientists, but you try and teach them the Dharma and they don't get it. Okay, so when we talk about intelligence, it's not, you know, just the kind of intelligence that they think of in school where you get good grades by telling professors what they already know. That's true, isn't it? A lot of what we do in school, we just tell the teacher what they already know. And then we get good grades for it. But that doesn't mean that we've really learned anything. <laughs> yeah. But this is talking about we have the potential to really learn, which means, you know, we, we learn the Dharma and it go, it's in our bones. Yeah. So the, this feeling of what is beneficial, what is harmful, it's in our bones. And it really transforms the way we live. Yeah. So that when we're on the verge of doing some stupidagio, yeah, we remember, oh, what is beneficial in my life? What is harmful? What I'm about to do is not beneficial. <laughs> 
It's going to lead me down that slippery slope where I don't want to go. Yeah. If I do something else, that is beneficial. So I'm a human being with a choice. I can make that choice to do that. Yeah. So, you know, this, when we study the precious human life, you know, one of the factors is having that kind of first interest to learn the Dharma and second ability to really think about, you know, what to practice, what to abandon, to think about causality. Okay? And this leads us into understanding karma and the effects of karma. It also leads us to understanding dependent arising, which leads us to understanding emptiness, which leads to eradicating the defilements from the mind. Okay, but that understanding of karma that comes earlier is so important because the more we understand karma, the more we can look and and make really good decisions in our life. Uh And we can see, I don't know about you, but I can see before I became a Buddhist, okay, I had some ethical conduct my parents brought me up with, which was good. But I cheated. And I said, yes, that is ethical, but, you know, now I'm a grown-up. I want to try not following what my parents said and see what happens. Yeah, I want my freedom. I want to see what happens if I do the opposite here. Okay, and then you find out. And, uh, you know, some people's lives turn into one bad decision after the next bad decision. Yeah, Um, And they don't have opportunities in the environment around them to, to learn how to make good decisions. They don't have the support from people who are practicing ethical conduct to help support them when they're right on the border of, you know, should I do this or should I abstain? You know? So we have that fortune and, you know, let's appreciate it. Let's use it. Yeah. And it's hard sometimes. You know, you really want that 14th dish of ice cream. You know, you really want it. 13 things of ice cream was not enough. You want that 14th. And it's there. And you can get it. And it's mint chocolate chip. You know? And then something comes in your mind that says, well, first one didn't satisfy you, the second one didn't satisfy, the third one, all the way up to the 13th, why do I think getting one more scoop of ice cream is really going to satisfy me? Especially now, since I have a stomach ache from eating too much ice cream. Yeah? So yes, it looks good, but you know, let's give it the ice cream to somebody else. I'm passing today. Okay? So learning to abstain from something that looks like really good now to attain something that is really even better later on. So psychologists have done a lot of testing about this. You know, the people who go for the short-term pleasure versus the people who are willing to abstain abstain from the short-term pleasure to get something more, you know, later on. And, yeah, 
And those people who can abstain from the short-term pleasure tend to do better over time. Yeah? Because, that, you know, we, that's how we develop some, when it's talking about control over ourselves, it's not like, oh, oh I've got to abstain. I want that ice cream so bad. It's a wisdom mind. Yeah, it's a wisdom mind that says, oh, I want to be happy. What actually is going to bring that happiness? Yeah. And then making a wise decision based on that. Okay, so since I am able to recognize what is beneficial and what is of harm, it's an important kind of intelligence to have. Then, verse 20, self-centered thought comes up with another thing. You know, yes, but, yeah, it frightens me to think that I may have to give away my arms and legs you know, to that cougar. You know, and that there were two cougars. And they're going to, what are they going to do? Divide me equally in half? Huh? Do I have to go out to the forest at nighttime and lay down, wait for a cougar to come along? And that's how I create merit? No. Okay. So you see, self-centered thought, it's, it's really foolish. So the response to that, yes, but, is without discriminating between what is heavy and what is light, I am reduced to fear through confusion. Okay. So why am I afraid? Because I'm confused. Why am I confused? Because I can't discriminate what actually is the meaning of the stories we hear about the deeds of the bodhisattvas that sound so impossibly difficult to us. Okay? So we hear a story, you know, like the one of how the Buddha gave his um, body when he was a bodhisattva to the starving tigress so she had enough strength to feed her her tigrettes uh, cubs no kitties yeah to feed her tiger kitties yeah so the Buddha as a bodhisattva before when he was a bodhisattva gave his body for that so then we think yeah okay well no tiger is here, got to find the cougar, and I better do just what the Buddha did. Okay, so that's showing the lack of discriminating between what is heavy and what is light. Okay, that, that is not the, um, or not even heavy and light, what is productive and what is not productive, what is useful and what is not useful. Because if you've studied the Dharma, and this is, you know, one of the benefits of studying, uh, you see that there are, uh, for the Bodhisattva precepts, that we're not allowed to give up our body unless we are capable of controlling what our rebirth is going to be, or unless we just have so much compassion that we just can't not do it. But, you know, the motivation has to be compassion, and we have to have the skill in ensuring that we have a good rebirth. Otherwise, if we give away our body and you know, out of some kind of emotional thing of, yes, I'm going to sacrifice everything. But we haven't done enough purification. We don't have control of our mind. And so as, you know, the, the, um, the cougar is, you know, coming to, to prepare you for dinner, uh, you get angry and upset and fearful and you go, what have I done? Then, you know, you might, you're going to find up 
wind up falling to a lower rebirth. Yeah, so if we can't, if we don't have a steady compassion, if we don't have the ability to direct our mind at the time of death, then sacrificing our precious human life, yeah, isn't worth it because it's so difficult to get this kind of opportunity. Yeah, so we shouldn't get these strange ideas um, which people often get at the beginning of Dharma practice of, you know, I'm going to be the ultimate ascetic, you know, and I'm sleeping on the cold brick floor and I'm eating, I'm going to be like the Buddha and eat one grain of rice a day. Yeah. And then, but if I only eat one grain of rice, the two, the cougar is going to go hungry. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll eat two grains of rice, you know, and then I'll feed my body to the cougar. And then I'll be Buddha, you know. Uh, and we have these kind of ideas. Yeah. And so we misinterpret the stories that we hear. And the stories we hear about what the great bodhisattvas are able to do is totally amazing. But what we do is think, I should be able to do that tomorrow. Instead of thinking, you know, I need to create the causes and conditions to be able to do that in the future. And creating the causes and conditions now is worthwhile because it will lead me to have that ability in the future. So it's kind of like, yeah, um, Remember when you were a little kid and there were certain things that really interested you, okay? And, you know, what, what's an example, something you wanted to learn or be when you were a kid? Save what? Save endangered species in Africa. Okay, so you wanted to save all the endangered species in Africa. Okay, and you were four years old. Okay. And I want to save all the endangered species in Africa. So what do I have to do? Go to Africa. Yeah? So mom and dad, yeah, buy me a ticket to Africa. Don't come with me because I know you're going to be overprotective. I'm going to go to Africa and live in, you know, in the, in the um, not the plains, the... Savannah? What? Savannahs. Yeah, the savannas. I'm going to live in the savannas, and I'm going to work with the government, and we are making it so there are no poachers anymore, and so that all the lions become vegetarian. They're not going to kill other endangered species, okay? And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just change everybody's diet so there isn't the food chain, and we'll get rid of all the poachers, you know, they can eat ice cream, and we're going to change the corrupt government, um, and we're four years old, and we're going to go do it all, and we're leaving tomorrow. <laughs> okay? Yeah? Now, if, if that were your child, yeah, who thought like that, what would you say to your child? Yes, that's wonderful that you want to do that. It's wonderful. It's so beneficial. All the endangered species will really appreciate it. But to be able to do that, you have to learn some other things first. Okay, so that's why you're going to go to kindergarten and learn ABC. Yeah, and you're going to learn, one, two, how to do addition and subtraction so that you can, you know, manage all of those uh, charts. Not charts. Um, uh, Excel sheets? What? Excel sheets. Excel sheets. Manage. Uh, yeah. She's going to come with you and, and make them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, all the spreadsheets with all the numbers of, you know, which endangered species have how many things and what they need, 
to eat every single day so that they can be here. And, you know, you need to learn some things about statistics. But to learn statistics, you have to learn one, two, you know, addition and subtraction. And to write reports for the government, you need to learn ABC. And to learn how to skillfully present things to the people in the government, you need to learn how to work with other people. So what you want to do is fantastic. And let's get you going on creating the causes so you can do that. Then your kid goes, that sounds good. Yeah, thank you for for having faith in me and giving me the courage to go forward and showing me what I need to do so that I can go to Africa and, and do that. Yeah. So we need to be that, that same way with ourselves in terms of our practice. Yeah. And, and see, oh yeah, okay. Before I can stay in samadhi, for a day and night, uh, you know, focused on the emptiness of inherent existence. Uh, there's, you know, I have to meditate in precious human life. I have to learn about karma. There's a lot of things I have to learn. Then there's things I have, I have to put those into practice in my lifetime. Yeah. And I got to purify all the times when I blew it and I've got to, you know, do a merit making practice. But all of those things are helping to create the causes and conditions so that I can become a Buddha. Nobody's expecting me to be a Buddha by tomorrow, you know, and nobody's expecting me to, to go give my body to some cougar tomorrow or tonight even, <laughs> you know. So, but if I practice slowly, slowly, and learn these things, then I can do it. Okay. So we have to have that long-term vision. Okay. And that long-term vision is so important. And that's where giving up some small immediate pleasure to get some bigger pleasure comes in. Okay. Because you know, on the path, you have to give up a few small things, but it's worth it for the big ones. Okay. And then that, and every time then, when you really see how cause and effect works that way, then every time, you know, you restrain from one negativity that you're really tempted to do. Yeah. Then you feel, some sense of accomplishment. Yeah. Wow. I did something I couldn't do before. I'm a little bit closer. Yeah. And you encourage yourself and you go forward that way. Okay. So instead of reducing myself to fear because I've misunderstood and I don't understand what I've misunderstand is what I need to practice now and what I need to practice later, you know, and I've confused those, then, you know, I think it's all hopeless. But it's not. It's not. You know, if the Buddha were once like us, confused, yeah, doing tons of stupid agios, and he managed to become a Buddha, then we can too. The Buddha, you know, wasn't, hasn't been a Buddha since beginning this time. He's once a sentient being like us. Okay. In fact, we probably hung out with pre the previous continuity of the Buddha because, you know, they say we've known everybody, all the sentient beings in a previous life. So, you know, maybe the Buddha was your pal when you went, when he was a sentient being and and, you know, we were two, and we were buddies, and we used to go hunting. Yeah? Or we used to go fishing, or we used to go to the bar and get roariously drunk. Yeah? But what happened after that? Well, the Buddha started practicing the path. And 
I kept going hunting and fishing and getting drunk and, you know, learning how to ride on a sailboat and, uh, you know, all sorts of other things. And the Buddha practiced the path and got enlightened. So that's the difference. So, you know, let's do something this life. Verse 21, for over countless myriads of eons, I have been cut, stabbed, burned, and flayed alive innumerable times, and I have not awakened. Okay? So if you accept multiple lifetimes, yep, that's all happened to us before. So we've sacrificed our bodies, not just to uh, cougars, yeah, but, uh, you know, We've fought in wars. We've been criminals, so we've been cut, stabbed, burned, flayed alive. Yeah, and it hasn't done any good. So just sacrificing our body, you know, giving up our body, getting ourselves killed, that is not the path to awakening. Yeah, and 22 says, yet the suffering involved in my awakening will have a limit. So All that beginningless suffering that I've experienced, getting killed for no benefit, you know, has not made me awakened at all. So, you know, stop these fanciful ideas of, you know, finding that, uh, you know, that cougar and giving our body. Um, Yeah, but if I get afraid even of the suffering I have to experience this life, you know, giving up that 14th dish of ice cream, you know, that the intense suffering that comes from that. Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? When you really are attached to some flavor that you want and, you know, and even the doctors told you, you know, don't eat that. Oh, but, but... It's so good. I really want it. You know, so the the suffering involved in in giving that up. Okay. Um, So even that suffering, which is actually not such a great suffering. Have you ever noticed that when you really, really crave something, if you shift your attention to something else and do something else, you forget about what you are craving? Yeah. Any parent knows that. Yeah. When you have a baby that cries, what do you do with the baby that cries? Yeah. You, if you're inside, you take the baby outside. Different environment, the baby stops crying. If you're outside, you take the baby inside. Stop crying. You know, it's amazing. You just change the environment a little bit. And usually the baby is so shocked by seeing something different that that they stop. Have you ever... It doesn't always work. Sometimes you're in in a grocery store... And the person ahead of you in line has a baby that's that's very peaceful, and then they see you and they go, eh! um, so sometimes it works that way. But sometimes, yeah, the, the baby's crying and you go up and you start doing something, you know, and and the baby stops. Hmm? Ch- change the environment just a little bit. And so that works for us too. I don't know about you, but, you know, I just do something else and take my mind off of obsessing what I want. Yeah? And it it usually works. And then afterwards, it's like, yeah, I don't really feel like doing that anyway. (laughs) Okay? So the suffering involved in awakening the suffering of not following all of our attachment and craving, the suffering of not telling someone off when you're really mad at them, 
the suffering of restraining our anger when we really want to get even with somebody who harmed us. Okay. All of that kind of suffering has a limit. Okay. It is like the suffering of having an incision made in order to remove and destroy a greater pain. Okay. So you don't feel well? Oh, very good example. You have a toothache. Yeah. You ever had a toothache that's really hurt? I had a toothache when I was in Russia a few years ago, and I was flying back to the U.S. the next day, and I was thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm going to be on this long plane ride with this toothache. Yeah. Very fortunately, somebody remembered that if you uh, uh, put clothes near the the tooth, it stops the pain. And they gave me some cloves, and I ate cloves the whole plane ride <laughs> until I got back and then called Dr. Ben and said, help, um, and got, an ins- in, got it in- extracted. Okay, so it's the suffering of having an incision made in order to remove and destroy a greater pain. So you have a tooth extracted to stop the pain. The extraction initially, you know, actually the extraction didn't hurt. You know, he gave me a shot of Novocaine. They pulled the tooth. You know, they gave me a prescription for painkillers. I didn't even fulfill it. You know, you they just you just shove some a coil of of cotton in there and bite down, you know, and rinse your mouth with salt water. Um, so you know something that before you have the extraction seems like ah, this is gonna hurt, you know, because you imagine, you know, like the big thing of pliers like you know in the barn you know <laughs> and there he is he's coming at you with the pliers and it's going in your tooth yeah. no it's you know and you think oh, oh, oh I'm not gonna scream um yeah but actually it's not that bad and um uh, what was really funny is the <laughs> You know, you're, after the the um, the uh, extraction, you know, you have that cotton where they your tooth once was to stop the bleeding, and you're supposed to bite down on the on the cotton. And somebody I didn't know was picking me up and taking me back to the abbey, and uh, some because the person who was supposed to drive me couldn't, and they asked a friend to, so. I'm in the car with somebody I don't know who, of course, wants to talk. What do you do when, you know, when you meet somebody, you want to talk to them and ask them questions? Uh, I'm sitting there like this. They were so sweet. I was trying to talk and still hold on to the piece of cotton. Um, Okay. But these... You you do something painful because it actually eliminates a bigger pain. Yeah, I mean, that's why, you know, if you have tumors, you have them taken out or whatever. So um, to remember that, that sometimes for a bigger goal, you have to undergo something that's a little bit uncomfortable. Okay. So 20, uh, okay, I'll... Okay, let's stop here. You may have some questions or comments. Just a comment. Well, I think that our our culture and our world, and I think that's why it's so helpful to be at the Abbey, is so is so dictated by the fact that you can get just about anything you want in a very, very short time. Mm -hmm. So it's hard not to transfer all of that quick expectation, quick fix into a process that takes a whole lot longer than you can imagine. Yeah. So I find that 
in the beginning, even now, sometimes when I'm getting into some of the bigger, heavier, the pains that are long-term misery that I make for myself, I just want it to be over. You know, why I just want to hit some button. I want to, to just alleviate it because it's been going off for so long. I know the drill. It's always painful, but it's going to take time. But that, that culture of, you know, hit it, hit a button and it's over. It, it, it colors my, my framework a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that that is becoming m what makes Dharma practice sometimes more challenging for young people today is because, uh, and young people in developed countries, because you can get what you want so quickly. And, you know, and you don't have to give up anything. And it, it does make it more difficult. But life always presents enough challenges so that at some point we learn that we have to deal with them. Or we don't learn and we're miserable our whole lifetime. Huh? You had a question? It's more a comment about, about discouragement, kind of similar to what Venerable Simke was say, said. It was liberating to discover when we when I first learned about joyous effort that that discouragement is a mental habit. And to begin to see, you know, I grew up with a mother who took Valium, you know, let's take a Valium and go to bed while we deal with <laughs> things will be better when I come back, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and so, and, and we have this in our society. Let's go out and have a drink. Let's go out and let's go get stoned. Let's go do something to, to erase the pain and not ever even actually analyze whether there's actually pain. Mm -hmm. It's just a mental habit then of I want to hang up because it looks too hard or it looks a little scary or it looks a little something. And so to be able to to see this is just a habit of mind. It keeps coming. But but at this it, point you can recognize it's just a habit. Yeah, we shouldn't dismiss it as just a habit. That's true. It's a very ingrown Definitely. wrong idea. Yeah, very definitely. But but my yeah. point though is that it's it's in my mind. Mm -hmm. It's just it's yes. way my mind is going. Yes. That's what I mean. It's just a habit. I don't have to let my mind go there. I can also look exactly. at an alternative to how to be with this. Mm -hmm. That's hugely liberated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 No, I said that because sometimes I hear people say, "Oh, it's just a habit." As if well, yeah, I, I should be able to get rid of it in a couple of days. No, these things are, are quite deeply rooted, and it's going to take time and consistent effort. Uh -huh. So, But it's possible to do, and when you think of the long-term results of not doing it and the benefits of doing it, then, yeah, you know. What is it? Cost, cost, pay analysis? Cost benefit. cost, benefit analysis. Yeah. So you do that, you know, instead of for running a business for, you know, how to, how to become a Buddha. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Okay. So encouraging ourselves is something, it's a skill that we can develop. Yeah. And so we should actually practice developing that skill, encouraging ourselves. And we should practice that skill, encouraging others as well. Yeah. And pointing out things that, that people do well. Because when we point out what they do well, they feel encouraged. And we feel happy. Yeah. Oh, actually, I did this, this thing yesterday. It was a, um, like a Q&A session with other monastics. Did anybody here watch it? I watched bits and pieces of it. Okay. So they asked really, really good questions. Really good questions. So... One of the questions was, when you live in a community and 
uh, some people like to meditate, and some people like to study, and some people want to do social engaged work, and some people, you know, want to do all these other kinds of things. How, how do you, like, create harmony in the community when people want to do all these different, you know, some people like rituals and some people can't stand them, and how, how do you create harmony? Yeah. I answered with one word. Yes, yeah, great question. A few times I answered with one word. I said, you rejoice. Yeah? You see other people doing virtuous practices that may not be your cup of tea, but you rejoice. And then you feel happy, they feel encouraged. You create a lot of money, uh, a lot of merit. <laughs> okay, yeah, but it's true. So it's, you know, you encourage other people, and when you rejoice, you encourage yourself. And then I said, and then the community's harmonious. Because you're not sitting there saying, everybody has to practice exactly the way I do, or I have to practice the exact way everybody else does. No, there's, there's different differences among people, and people will practice in their own way, and you just rejoice at the merit that other people are creating, even though, you know, that may not be the style of practice you enjoy, or you may not be able to do that at this particular moment. Yeah, but they are capable of it, so you rejoice. <laughs>